So tonight, uh, we're going to get into our lesson uh, that we're going to have. We're going to look at our um, the, the last one we have for the cemetery prayer here tonight. So thank everybody for your, your attendance. Uh, just to summarize for those that may not have heard some of the, the others, uh, what we've been looking at is from John chapter 11, verses 41 and 42. And this is where we read about Jesus's prayer to uh, that he prayed right before Lazarus was raised from the dead. And the first things we had looked at was the situation for the prayer. What were those things that happened ahead of time? Uh, so there was sickness. Uh, there was the death that occurred with Lazarus. There was skeptics and there was doubt about who Jesus was. And then last week, we talked about some of the specifics of the prayer. And what could we learn from the prayer that Jesus had prayed there? And some of the things that we learned about was that how Christ prayed continually. And we were able to see that from Scripture, that he had already been in prayer and talking with the Lord. We were able to see, um, see here how uh, he was able to be pray and be unashamed of the prayer uh, that he was praying. And that's a good example for us when we're out and eating uh, food in a restaurant that we're, not un that we're not ashamed to pray and thank God for the food that he's given to us, that we need to be able to do that at any time. He had prayed believing with an anticipation that God would answer the prayers, uh, the prayer that he had asked and we also learn how he was grateful uh, there during the prayer, that he had thanked God for the answer to prayer that was going to happen, and how that is a good lesson for each of us to think about whenever we pray and talk to God, is that we need to pray believingly and also be thankful for uh, in anticipation of what God is going to do. So tonight we're going to look at the sequel of the prayer or what is the result of the prayer that Christ have prayed. And so there are four things that we can find and see from this. Uh, we see the what happens after this that Jesus some preaching. We can see the power of God, the persuasion, and the perniciousness uh, that had occurred. So first we want to look at the preaching tonight. So in John chapter 11 and verse 43 is where one of the main texts will be taken from. So if you have your Bibles, please open that. There won't be, it's not a very long uh, verse that we'll be looking at. Uh, but the main part that we want to see tonight in John 11, 43, he says, Lazarus, come forth. Within this precept and the message that Christ had here, uh, we can see three things. One was that it was very fitting for the situation. We can see that it was fearless, that there was no fear there. And also, uh, it was a forceful calling that had taken place, a forceful preaching. So, uh, when we see this Lazarus come forth, this precept was the message that was most needed at this time. You know, there was one who was dead, and they needed to come to life. This is the same way that the gospel is today, that there are many people who are dead in sins, and they need to be quickened within their spirit. They need to come alive, and it's through that preaching of God's word that they're able to hear. In Ephesians 2.1, it says, people are dead in trespasses and sins. And it says, and they, uh, it says here, and we need to uh, live or we need to need life, which can only uh, that only Christ can give to us. So, and then the uh, the some of the continue here in Acts seventeen thirty says God commandeth all men everywhere to repent. You know that is the message. The, the message is for all men to repent, to ask God for forgiveness. This is not just saying, I'm sorry, this goes much deeper than being sorry, but turning from the ways of the world. You know, there, there are other messages out there. There are other messages that 
the world is trying to teach us. There are other messages that people are bringing into the churches to try and get people to believe. But any other message but this one, that Christ is the only way and we need to repent of our sins, is the wrong message. Today we hear about the social gospel that is being preached. That is where everyone is good and everyone can get to heaven. Uh, we'll go to heaven. We hear about the gospel of being politically correct. That is not wanting to offend anybody. You know, that is not the good news message. We have the gospel of good works where it says, if you do good things, that is how you make it to heaven. It's not that there. Uh, and then we also hear about the gospel of cults. This is, is all religions that are different from that of what Christ pre preached. So that is the, the other types that are out there. And you can just pick one. There are many. There are many out there. And Satan is using them all to try and bring, take people away from Christ. So it is the gospel message of Jesus Christ that we need to preach. It is the one that preachers need to preach. It is the one that all brothers and sisters in Christ need to teach and share with those around them. You know, the person who ends up praying will end up having the right message. The reason for that is because they have spent time with the Lord. They have spent time with Christ. It's only through spending time with him that we're able to know the right message to be able to preach. You know, if we do not spend time with him, we begin spending time with the, these other thoughts that are out there. We begin spending time with other people who are sharing other things. And this is how we end up. And without spending that time with the Lord, we cannot know, truly know the master and be able to preach his gospel. The next one is fearless. What we see here is Lazarus come forth. Uh, the precept here is being fearless. Even despite the skepticism and the doubt that we've already learned about, Christ was fearless in saying the message, Lazarus, come forth. He knew that he was not very popular at this time because he was being very criticized. One, for him saying that he was the son of God. He was also criticized because he did not come to save Lazarus. There are many people here in Bethany that love Lazarus, and they did not understand why this man that was supposed to be the Christ did not come and save him. They did not understand that. There was this doubt and skepticism all around. So we can imagine that Jesus knows our thoughts. He knew what people were thinking, but yet he still prayed a fearless prayer. And through this, he ended up preaching one that was fearless. He didn't care what the other people thought. He did what was right because it was right. How we need that in our world today, that people to stand up for what is right, not to stand up for something that will sway them to the left or to the right, but stand upon the word of God and what God says. We need that today within our people. We need that in order to preach the tr truth of God. The third thing we end up looking at is how the how Christ had preached, and it was forceful. Before we read about Lazarus come forth, it says he cried with a loud voice. Not only did the loud voice indicate forcefulness, but also did the command that came with that. So yes, there was a loud voice, and then there was the command of Lazarus come forth. Christ was being dogmatic in this situation, meaning that there was an undeniable truth that Lazarus would come forth. The message was not a tongue-in-cheek message that lacked conviction, as some do today. This was a message that proclaimed with finality. The gospel must be preached the same way today. And it, it, and it can be preached the same way. If God's preachers will be the men of prayer that God has called them to be, you know, if believers can share the gospel, or believers can share the gospel the same way, without fear and with forcefulness and with that conviction in their soul that they're preaching the truth, that believers can do the same thing today 
if they spend time with the Lord in prayer. The next passage that we want to look at is we're going to find the power behind Jesus' prayer and the preaching here. So there was power behind it. In John eleven forty four, it says, He that was dead came forth. It's John eleven forty four. There was divine power in the performance of Christ after he had prayed. Everyone who would serve Christ will discover or that serves Christ will discover that prayer brings power to, to the service of the Lord. There's a man, A.J. Gordon. He had written a book called Quiet Talks on Prayer. And he had said in that book, Surely the greatest power entrusted to man is prayer power. You know, just recently within our church, just on Sunday, we talked about three prayers being answered in the past week, and we were able to see God's power demonstrated through those prayers of three people going to the hospital last week, and all three of them coming home, and how we can give God the, the be grateful and thankful for what the Lord has done for that, and to be able to see Him work. You know, today I find that, you know, there, there are many believers out there uh, that are lacking faith. And a lot of that is because they do not spend time with God in prayer. Prayer is not just list, listing your wants before God. It's not just coming up with a list and saying, Lord, here are the things that need to be done. And that you just, you know, you kind of have your list and you sit down and you just kind of read your list off to, off to God. That is not what prayer is. Prayer, prayer is partly that, but there is a big portion of prayer that is for us to be listening to God that we need to, you know, be listening for that still small voice, that when we're talking to him, that we are sensitive to his spirit, and we can know that he's nearby, and, you know, we can feel his arms begin to wrap around us, and know that he is right there with us, and that he is helping us through the troubles and the storms that we're going through. It's through this time, through this prayer time, that is what helps to develop our relationship with Christ. It's not just the listening of those needs. It's spending that time. It's taking time to ask him, Lord, what would you have me to do in my life? What would you like for me to do? How would you like for me to see me live my life? How should I make these decisions? What, Lord, what is your will for my life? And to ask him those things and then listen for what he has. And when we begin to take that time in prayer with him and listening to him and having a conversation with him, that is when we'll begin to see the miraculous happen within our life. That is when we'll begin to see the miraculous happen within those around us. That we'll be able to see our friends that, that are uh, around us and being able to, uh, they'll be able to see God move within their life. The third thing that we can see here that, that Christ had preached on was uh, in chapter 11, verse 45. It says, Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did believed on him. The persuasion is what we see here. After Christ had prayed, a number of people believed. The miracle gave these people good reason to believe on Christ. They were able to see this miracle happen with their very eyes. It wasn't something that they had heard about. These people were in Bethany. Many, Jesus spent most of his time around the Sea of Galilee is where most of his ministry was. He performed most of the miracles around that area, but yet he's come to Bethany now. And the people may have heard the stories of how he's healed the blind, how he healed the lame. He, he, he made the, those who couldn't walk, walk again. They've heard these stories, but they may not have ever seen them. And here we, they now find themselves looking at this man, Jesus. And he's standing before the tomb of Lazarus, whom they know is dead, that he's been laid in the grave. And they know that there's no chance for him to rise up. But yet they saw Lazarus rise. They saw this miracle that only Christ could perform.
you know, they had trouble believing initially, but now they do. You know, this miracle gave these people a good reason to believe on Christ. You know, believing in Christ is not stupid, it's not unreasonable, and it's not without any good evidence. The miracle in this case was abundant evidence about Christ. And the praying of Christ was related to the com conversion of the people. For Christ had said in verse 42, Because of the people which, I, which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. So in his prayer, he had asked the Lord to touch their hearts, to help them believe that as he prayed and before he preached and said, Lazarus, come forth, that in his prayer, he asked God to help them believe that he was the Messiah. And because of that, we see the conversion of these people. The prayer had went up, the mir miraculous had occurred, and a conversion had happened within their hearts. You know, we must pray for persuasion of sinners to come to a saving knowledge of Christ too. You know, who do we pass on a daily basis? Who do we speak to? Who does God bring into our lives, whether it's at the store or at our workplace? Who are those people that God brings our way that we need to help persuade, to pray for? You know, I had read a book, um, been several years ago now, and there are some things in it that began to make me think, you know, those of us who may pray for our food before we eat uh, at a restaurant, you know, think about those people who just prepared our food. Think about that waitress that may come and wait on us. How many of those people know Jesus? The answer is many of them probably do not whenever you look at statistics. Many of them are lost and on their way to hell. We need to remember that each one of them to be saved. And, you know, I, I've thought many times I don't always do it. And I've been uh, trying to get in a better habit. Again, we don't eat out a whole lot. Uh, so we don't always get to uh, do it this way. But try to, you know, when we're at a restaurant and we're about ready to eat, when we thank God for our food, to ask God to help those who have prepared it and served us to make a way for them to know him. You know, that what we don't realize is that may be the only prayer that ever goes up for them. You know, where Gina's been staying with her mamma, or Susie's been staying with her mamma and papa, uh, they're camping that she met a little girl a couple of night, a couple of evenings ago, and she was swimming with her, and she lives right here in our area. She didn't come from out of town. She's only 30 minutes away from the campground, and Susie had mentioned God to her. Susie came back over to me, and she went to Regina, and maybe even Mamma and Papa as well. But she came back and said, you know, she's never heard of God. Here's a nine-year-old girl. She's lived almost a decade on this planet and has never heard of God, has never heard of Jesus. Oh, how we need to do a much better job of persuading the lost to come and know him. How we need to do a better job of telling people about Jesus. It's easy for us to get involved in our Christian circles and stay with our friends where we know that it's safe, but we need to get out and we need to find those who are lost and to tell them about Christ. Because if we do not do that, who else is going to? Who else will do it? It's up to us, church. It's up to us to be able to tell those people about Christ. And then the fourth thing tonight and the last one is a perniciousness that we look at tonight, meaning a cause to death or ser serious injury is what that word means. And what we read about here in verse 46, it will help bring it together a little bit for you. It says, but some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and told them the things that Jesus had done. So there was these people that were there. We just read about those who become believers. But as we know, not everybody becomes a believer. Not everybody is going to accept Christ as their Savior. And that's unfortunate. We would love for everybody to go to heaven with us, to go to heaven with God, 
to live with them with him because we know that he has true love for all of us and he wants to show that to them but they are not allowing god to show that love to them but these people here instead of choosing to see the love of god to see that this was the messiah they chose to run to the pharisees and say look what this jesus has done these pharisees have already heard about jesus he's already been in the temple and turned the tables upside down and run the money changers out he's done this already within his life they've heard about this man around galilee and they've kind of left him alone because he wasn't coming around jerusalem but here we find in bethany he's this period of time it's not long after this that he ends up being crucified and dying on the cross. Here we find that the, some of those people went to the Pharisees. They're saying, look, here's this Jesus. He just raised this man from the dead. He's causing hostility. He's causing problems. People are going to begin believing on him that he is the Messiah when we know that he's not, is what was coming out of their mouths. They were wrong in that. They were wrong in their thoughts. But that's what they were telling them. You know, we must spend time, earnest prayer with God. You know, there are people that will always be skeptics. Those who always try to get rid of the church. And it seems like there are many today here in America that are trying to do that. They're trying to squelch the gospel. They're doing anything that they can, and we see that through the virus even, of states making laws, closing down churches. We see that happening. But you know what? The gospel will go on. The gospel will continue to go on. The Lord will continue to see people saved. It is through sometimes persecution that we end up finding the church grows the most. You know, we've been very satisfied as a church in America. We have not had any conflict over the years. We have had places that are free to worship. But what's the church going to look like if this persecution continues? What will that look like? What will true persecution look like? How will the church stand? We will then begin to see who the true believers are. We will see who those people are that act who have a relationship with Christ because they will know deep within their soul that it doesn't matter what happens to them. They will serve the Lord to the very end. They will not compromise their faith. They will be fearless and have courage to stand and continue to see the gospel spread, to see people saved by the telling of the gospel. Satan is real. He wants us to hunker down. He wants us to stop telling the gospel. He wants to do what he can to stop the message from being told. You know, it's through our time of prayer with the Lord. It's through that time of communion with the Lord that he gives us that courage that we need. It's through that time that we can know that we're standing on a firm foundation of truths that will never fall from under us because we're standing on the solid rock of Christ. Those are the things that we can know tonight. And we can know that there will continue to be opposition, but we will not have to fear that opposition because we're living for Christ.